Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Occasionally, art and architecture become so closely associated with belief and tradition that it is hard to separate the two. Because of the TV special Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Christmas has its very own form of animation, stop motion. And while there are many other places this technique has been used, for many it is impossible to separate the two. My theory will not be fully proven until Hallmark produces a Christmas romance puppet stop-motion movie. For Christianity, then, the Gothic style has become the Christian brand, such that its basic elemental forms are recognizable as church in endless variations and different applications. This is true in the way that a two-year-old can recognize a cat, whether it is a real cat, a picture of a real cat, a cartoon of a cat, or even a stuffed animal cartoonish version of the cat. The two-year-old has intellectualized the platonic concept of ideal form and knows what elements make a cat. Eyes, whiskers, pointed ears, tail, etc. Even if the two-year-old has not read Plato's Republic. That is why when people initially see the First Baptist Church by Harry Weiss in Columbus, Indiana, they know it is a church. It exudes a churchy ideal form that has been ingrained in the Western human psyche since the Gothic era, and I think because it is easily recognized, it is a popular modernist church. Set prominently in the middle of a big rolling grass field and surrounded by single-family houses, the vertical forms are more starkly dominant, like a pilgrimage cathedral above a medieval village. Built in 1965, it could easily have been heralded as one of the first great buildings of post-modernism. That's the movement that said that modernists should look to history now and then for inspirational forms. But we derided post-modernists as being glib and socially uncommitted. He believed in the call for modern architecture to continually innovate, but not pander to historic trivia. Meanwhile, he also resisted the drab rectilinearity of Mesian architecture. Weiss was determined, rebellious, obsessive, charming, and driven. But even if he burned all those bridges among his colleagues, they were still forced to recognize him as the conscience of architecture. Harry Weiss truly believed that great architecture could improve the world. The church form Weiss uses is a transformation of an emerging church style from the mid-20th century. These churches embraced a kind of A-frame style in their effort to create transcendent space, employing light, loft, and craft. This goes back to the 1950s with houses by architects John Campbell and Andrew Geller popularizing the form, particularly for beach or lake houses. Shortly after, they were embraced as churches for their dramatic loft, their simplicity, and the symbolic form of praying hands. And there were endless variations of them around the world. I did a fellowship hall addition to a 1966 Lutheran church by architect Charles P. Winter, which was essentially contemporaneous with Weiss's church. Here the A-frame dominates the sanctuary space, giving the church its sense of loft. Light is brought in through the openings in the end gables and a discrete linear skylight above. Most of these churches have little craft, statues, or pictorial stained glass, as it was less necessary owing to the greater literacy and as a revolt against Catholic opulence, which is theologically noble unless you are a sculptor or a stained glass artist. The structure of the A-frame is usually glue laminated beams, arches, and decking, providing an organic warm wood finish and the natural expression of the dynamic structure. This is one of the reasons I used a similar system for the fellowship space edition, but asymmetrically, so that the new smaller vault is still deferential to the dominant central A-frame of the church designed by Winter himself. Architects should know their place.
Glue laminated wood, aka glue lamb, is wood cut into thin layers and adhered with glue. The result is a material stronger than conventional woods that can be formed into shapes, depths, and lengths not available through harvesting trees. The material has replaced heavy timber construction and is better resistant to fires than steel. Glue lamp technology goes back to the 1901 patent by German carpenter Otto Karl Friedrich Hetzer, but it was used for the first time in a Wisconsin school gym in 1934. In 1952, a trade association was formed to promote glue lamp, which is why we see the rapid expansion of the buildings using this material after World War II. I use glue lamp often for larger rooms as the material is an economical way to span large spaces, express the structure, protect against fire spread, and provide that natural wood finish. The engineering is simple enough for an architect to understand, and the product is available in many grades of finish and color. And you can see Weiss uses the glue lamp material as part of the dominant root form's interior finish. These A-frame churches and Weisses, in one sense, built the steep wooden roof of a Gothic church with the stone nave removed. Thus, the roof is sitting almost completely on the ground. Note that even in Gothic churches, the roof is a wood structure above the stone groin vaults. By bringing that roof to the ground, the congregation in the pews is elevated into the rafters, into the heavens above, a very powerful statement of loft essential to transcendent space. In most A-frame churches, the glazed open gable ends hint at the void within. But the distinguishing difference in Weiss's church is the end gables are closed off with more roof, hiding the lofty void. It is the two triangular brick walls extending above the roofs that hint that his building has internal openness, the void beneath. Because the exposed brick is visually cut by the roof, it has a profile a bit like a stone vaulted arch in traditional Gothic churches. Gothic form and church, the art form, is inseparable from the belief. I have noted elsewhere that the pointed arch of Gothic churches is the iconic brand for Christian churches. It has been applied ad nauseum to boxy buildings that otherwise have nothing Gothic about them and certainly are not trying to create the crystal walls of the City of God, the New Jerusalem, as described in the Book of Revelation. What is particularly interesting, then, is that Weiss and these other architects, in deconstructing the Gothic church, have found another form that is iconically church, the steep and long gabled roof. For Weiss, then, who did not practice any religion, this was strictly a design issue. When being interviewed for another church commission, he was asked what his religious beliefs are, and he responded by saying, My father was an Episcopalian, my mother Presbyterian. I'm an architect. Weiss's building is more than a single church, as it incorporates other functions of the congregation, offices, education, chapel, making it resemble a medieval monastery even more, complete with an inner courtyard. But Weiss is not limited by medieval form or modernist doctrine, and the result is unique and goes beyond what the other A-frame churches did. There are a lot of curves in the layout, a function of the modularity of brick and its ability to form curves in plan, which softens the flow through the building. Brick can also form curves in elevations by means of arches, but Weiss did not use any arches. Instead, the moment the building ascends above normal room height, the brick walls stop and the roofs start. The building complicates the transition by imposing the rigid rectilinear base of the straight steep wood roofs on the flowing curves of the brick. This complication both increases visual complexity but also defines the building materials organically. The bricks can curve, the wood remains straight. The result is that common spaces between the church and the chapel are low and would be dark but for the clever use of skylights and windows, permitting natural light into them. So a person entering through the low openings through a catacomb-like space in dark shadow enters the sanctuary or chapel to a roof line that explodes upward. Dramatic ethereal lighting is achieved not through traditional stained glass windows and pointed arches, attempting to make the building a city of light, 
but through slits that create a moody internal chiaroscuro that accentuates the grain of the natural interior finishes. Genius. Weiss designed the brutalist 17th Christ Scientist Church in Chicago, another church without traditional windows, but featured 350 hidden microphones allowing people in the congregation to give testimony without leaving their seats. He also designed the 1963 edition restoration of the fire-damaged St. Thomas Episcopal Church in Menasha, Wisconsin. About the latter church, Weiss is quoted as saying it was, quote, devoid of pomp, yet bold in belief. Material luxuriousness, no. Richness of space and light and sound, yes, end quote. We see the old church is engulfed by a new curved roof supported by brutalist concrete walls, and the church steeple, a defining religious form, starts from the ground instead of a tower, but still manages to call the believers to worship, like a traditional Gothic church. This building is severely unfamous and will require me to make a special trip the next time I'm in that region of the country, as I need to experience it to see if this combination really does work. As an aside, there's a whole lot of traditionalists who will disagree with me when I say that Gothic is the pinnacle Christian form of architecture. They will argue that Romanesque is not only more Christian, but particularly more Catholic. Weiss's church, being for Baptist, didn't have to regard any of that, other than he could easily have been inspired by Romanesque churches rather than Gothic. But I find the overall debate kind of silly. For these particular traditionalists who are promoting Romanesque as the only Catholic-style architecture, they should probably read the general instruction of the Roman Missal. This is where the Vatican tells you what they want for their liturgical space, and it never prescribes any particular style of art or architecture. So any design dogma promoted by liturgists or architects is just reflecting their own personal bias. Worship in general, and Christian worship in particular, is not required to be in any particular style of architectural space. To create transcendent space, you can manipulate light, loft, and craft in any number of potential architectural expressions. Remember, Jesus is described in the Bible as a carpenter, although the Greek word used to describe both St. Joseph and Jesus is tekton, builder. Architect, master builder, we've discussed that before. So if Jesus was a general contractor, he would certainly be able to describe to us exactly what his churches should look like. But Jesus didn't do that. Instead, he told us that we should love each other as he loved us. But I digress. We have noted before in other videos, both ACX video number 47 and ACX video number 54, how Columbus, Indiana features a lot of architecture commissions from renowned architects through J. Irwin Miller and his Cummings Foundation. The First Baptist Church is not one of those commissions. While it was independent of the Cummings Foundation, I think it is safe to say the awareness of great architecture created by the program contributed to Harry Weiss becoming the architect for the First Baptist Church. Weiss had already designed the 1955 Cummings Engine Plant Addition and Renovation, the Hamilton Community Center, the Hope Branch Bank, the Eastbrook Plaza Bank, the Northside Middle School, and the Otter Creek Golf Clubhouse. He would go on to one more commission, the 1968 Cummings Technical Center. Notice that they are all radically different from each other. He was not going about branding buildings so there could be a lot of weesiness all over Columbus, Indiana. Instead, he approached each project with a blank sheet of paper. And I just think that exemplifies his architectural greatness. Harry Weiss attended MIT and Yale in the 1930s, where, because of the Depression, many architects looked to modern design to better serve humanity rather than indulge in decadent and expensive historic designs. Again, this is fine as long as you are not an expert woodcarver or did decorative plaster work. He toured Europe on a bicycle in 1937 when he started sketching and writing in notebooks. There would eventually be 100 such notebooks. Soon after, Weiss got a fellowship to the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan, where his architectural idealism was fostered. 
He worked for SOM prior to enlisting in the U.S. Navy during World War II, but returned to SOM briefly after the war. By 1948, he formed his own firm based in Chicago and practiced for many decades, some with his younger brother, architect Ben Weiss. His designs included houses, large public commissions, and even working on the team to design the Washington metro system. For a modernist, he was eclectic within that style, building glass boxes and concrete brutalist buildings. But he was also a strong advocate for historic preservation, helping preserve some of Chicago's most important buildings, such as Adler and Sullivan's Auditorium Theater and the Field Museum of Natural History. He also championed Maya Lin's design for the Vietnam Memorial. In the 1980s, still living the 1960s Mad Men, Four Martini Lunch, and Serial Infidelities lifestyle, his reputation suffered. His alcoholism, rooted in family problems from his childhood and perhaps other things, led to a complete breakdown. His health failed and he died in 1998 in a veteran's home. His firm was bought out by San Francisco-based Gensler in 2000, but Weiss had been long gone. His last words scribbled in his last notebook were, I'm okay, the world's all wrong. Legacy is such a vague concept. It is easy for a great artist to undo great works by losing favor through holding unpopular views or personal destructive habits. Most architects have no legacy among the general public, but within the profession there are heroes, and for a time, Harry Weiss was one of those heroes. But the cult of Harry Weiss does not yet exist, and we have seen how cult is critical to preserving some of our greatest buildings. And so while the buildings of cult-lacking architects, such as Paul Rudolph or Richard Neutra, constantly face demolition, I suspect that some of Harry Weiss's work is so beautiful, so elegant, such as the First Baptist Church, that people will treasure them long after they have forgotten who Harry Weiss was. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.